Hello again. Welcome to another episode of Leading from Alignment. Uh, my name is Jim Wiegand. I'm the co-host with our, our mentor, professor, father, crazy uncle, and friend, John Opaluski. <laughs> How are you today, John? Oh, you just keep adding titles to my name, Jack. <laughs> Jim, it's uh, I don't I never know what's going to happen uh, at the beginning of these, but it's, I'm good. It's good to be with you today. Good, good uh, visiting with you uh, before. And I always appreciate the opportunity to catch up uh, before we start recording. So I'm, I'm doing great. Good, good. So today, uh, Pod 115, I love the title because it, it sums up. If you say describe to me the Psalms in a single sentence, every Psalm that David ever wrote. It's this. What's the title for, for Pod 117? The title is God is Good, But We're Not Exempt. Yeah. And what, what do you mean by that? Well, let me let me give you a little backdrop. Uh, yeah. A few weeks ago, our interim pastor was preaching on Psalm 73. And uh, the psalm, it's a pretty popular psalm. The, the, the psalm tells the story of Asaph. Uh, Asaph was a psalm writer. He was a leader. He was a lover of God. And in this psalm, he... Uh, he kind of reveals that he had gone through a faith crisis. Mm-hmm. Um, he, he was a man of deep faith, he, but he was going through a, a season that was pretty tough. And, and at the same time, going through that season of difficulty, he noticed that there were people who didn't love God at all, mm-hmm. you know, who from his perspective had no problems. <laughs> yes, uh, you know, so I think we could boil his crisis down to this one question, you know, God, why am I going through this incredibly difficult time while those who don't love you are living the good life? Yeah. yeah. And, you know, I think, uh, I think, Jim, if we're honest, you and I have had that thought cross our mind at least once in our journey with Jesus. Yeah. Uh, we may have even spoken some version of those words. Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. I, I remember well the tantrum that I, that I threw. Uh <laughs> Because I, I was mad at God, but when you feel like God's not listening to you, then you just talk to your wife about it. And, I, and it's kind of a funny story in our marriage. Remember that time you threw a tantrum? And I, yes, I do. I, I mean, there's been many, but I remember that one time where I, yeah. it's not fair, you know, it's, it's not right. It's not, I'm working harder and sacrificing more and bearing my cross and, and here are these people driving these new cars and have plenty of money and not the, you know, not the pressures we have. And it's not fair. Where are you guys? Shouldn't I be blessed above, you know, the people that are living below what I'm living, which is a, now on this side of the tantrum, it seems like a pretty silly thing to say, but it was very real. At right. that moment, and moment since then, that, that question has been very real. And, and Jim, it's not uncommon, you know, for those of us who lead to experience a season yeah. of doubt. You know, I think about John the Baptist who yeah. had one of the most incredible God encounters in the history of mankind. When he baptized Jesus, the heavens opened. He heard the audible voice of God yeah. uh, and saw the Holy Spirit descend on Jesus in the form of a dove. And, and, and I don't know what the time lapse was between that and the time that he was in jail. I'm not sure of that. Yeah. But in jail, he sent his disciples to Jesus to ask, are you the one? So here's a guy, you know, I had this amazing experience. Yeah. And, and you know what that means to me, John, is that pain makes things that we've experienced. Pain makes lies sometimes feel more true, you mm-hmm. know, than, than the truth, because pain is a real experience. Just like that was a real experience. Yeah. You know, and Jesus' answer is not really comforting, is it? It's, you know, hey, these good things are happening. But in that list of good things in Isaiah, it's, you know, setting captives free. Well, he's a captive and he's not free. And Jesus leaves that out, but throws in that one sentence, blessed are you who are not offended because of me. Mm-hmm. That's, a, that's not, you know, I'm not going to always do what you expect me to do. Right. Uh, man. Yeah, that's tough. Yeah. And, and so, you know, when I say God is good, but we're not exempt, here's what yeah. I really mean, that we're not exempt from the trials and tribulations inherent. In a fallen yeah. world, we're not exactly. exempt from stress. We're not exempt from uh, confusion when we suffer loss. Uh, just recently, uh, our our church family, the church family that uh, I, I call home, lost another person to COVID. Uh, this was a 43 year old young man, father mm-hmm. of two young children who need their daddy. Yeah, and there were hundreds of people praying for this young man's recovery that he would be restored to health. And, and it didn't turn out as we had hoped. Yeah. And yet that thought, I couldn't get off that, that thought, Jim, that God is good, 
but we're not exempt. So the question I think I'd like us to answer today or try to answer today is this, how do we weather those seasons? Mm-hmm. You know, when life doesn't seem to make sense, when we, when we can't get our arms around disappointment or uncertainty um, or a dream that we had that didn't materialize, um, ASAF gives us a couple of things to think about in Psalm 73. So I'd like to, I'd like us to yeah, please. Yeah. rap about that. Here's the first one um, is that he didn't wrestle with his faith in front of everybody. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Could you unpack that a little bit? I, I know the context of why I'm laughing, but what, what is your context for that statement? Well, in Psalm 73, after he, he takes the first half of the Psalm to lay out his complaint. Yes. Um, yeah. And then he, but he follows it up with this very important sentence. He says, if I had said, I will speak thus, I would have betrayed your children. Yeah. You know, Asaph was smart enough to, to not share his faith struggle with everybody. Yeah, right. Um, and, 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 you know, he didn't, I'm pretty sure he didn't write this psalm. As a matter of fact, I think it, I'm 100% sure he didn't write this psalm while he was in the middle of his faith crisis. It was right. after he had worked his way through it successfully, yeah. then he shared it. Yeah. Um, you know, Jim, I've, I've had... I, you know, I don't get frustrated a, a lot about life, but I, I've had enough of notable Christian leaders deconstructing their faith in the public forum. Yeah. I've just yeah. had it, you know, in front of thousands yeah. of people, um, you know, on tens of thousands. Yeah. What do you think about that, that thought, you know, that he didn't do this in front of everybody and, and, and the danger of doing that in front of everybody as a leader? Yeah, I, and I, I, I think that last phrase is very important. As a leader, as a husband, as a father, as a pastor, as an elder, as a deacon, uh, I, I, I think everybody, everybody needs their own faith, and everybody needs to work out their own salvation with fear and trembling. Right. So it, it is going to be a process. The things I believed firmly at the beginning of my walk turned out many of them were biblically in error. I, I didn't know that. You know, right. somebody told me early on, there's only one Bible. I only wrote one Bible. It's the King James Bible, for example. Yeah. And you go, okay, as, as you get into that argument, you go, okay, well, it, it's a translation as are other translations. The one Bible that God did write, he didn't write in King James English. That's, that's a translation itself. So you, the things that the hills you're willing to die on at first are not necessarily those later. But I, but I think again, to, to have that, this is a faith crisis. It's not a doctrinal, right. this is a faith crisis. What I believed about God as it turns out, is not as true as I'd hoped it would be. Um, boy, I tell you, what, doubt attracts doubters. Yes. Faith attracts believers. Anger attracts the angry. And in a world of social media, where I have access not only to my friends but to all of my friends, 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 friends. There you go. You know, they say I'm having a doubt. Well, that will attract doubters. I, I'm right. angry. That will attract the angry. I'm injustice. That will attract those that are you know that are unjust. So. I, I think if this was ever true, then it's certainly, if I could say more true now, because if, I, if I'm building a great company, if I'm building a great church and I'm public about that, people that want to grow things will be attracted to me. If I'm deconstructing people that are mm-hmm. more confused, more angry, more hurt, I, you draw like unto like. So I, I would be that's very right. careful. I, I think it's good, wise advice from a guy who's been dead for several thousand years. To, to say, hey, someday, <laughs> you know, I, I'm a king, but we all have influence now. It, well, kings had greater influence, but now everybody reads what we write. Right. The people we've never met before will read what we write. So we, I think if there ever was a day we want to attract faith, courage, hope, it's, it's now. And the only way to do that is not by airing every doubt, every fear, every, and a lot of it's, it's not even doctrinal. A lot of it is personal. Yes. It's personal. It's, uh, gender stuff. It's, you know, right. I want people to agree with me. And if my church doesn't think this or my pastor doesn't think that, or I'm struggling my own beliefs, man, it just, it just attracts, you know, garbage attracts flies. And I don't, I mean, I'm not saying your thoughts are garbage. I'm just saying, be very careful about what odor you release to the world because yeah. it will attract things that are attracted to that odor. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, it makes sense. You know, so, so what we're not saying is you shouldn't, be honest about your faith crisis, but it's who you're honest with about it. Yes. That really, really matters. I, I would suggest this, that, that if you're struggling today, if you're listening or watching, you're, you're going through a season. First of all, we're sorry you're going through that. Um, but keep your faith struggle between you, God, and a few close brothers and sisters in Christ. Right, right. So telling the whole world you don't believe anymore is irresponsible. 
Yeah. Uh, and Jesus warns us about this, right? He says that anybody who leads his children astray will be held accountable. Yeah. I mean, he 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 uses some pretty strong imagery, right? You, you know, yeah. put this, and, uh, yeah. run, uh, run your neck and throw yourself into the sea. So, so we're not saying you should fly solo when you're struggling, but please be wise about who you bring along with you on that journey. Yes. Very true. Very true. So here's the second thing Asaph did. He, he uh, gathered with fellow believers to worship. He, he, uh, he goes on to write, when I try to understand, why am I going through this? People yeah. who don't love you aren't going through anything, you know, which is false, right? But in, his, <laughs> but in his perspective, that's what was real. He said, when I tried to understand this, it was oppressive to me until I entered the sanctuary of God. Mm. And then he writes, then I understood yeah. And, and I think when life doesn't make sense, sometimes the last thing we want to do is hang out with other believers. Yeah. You know, uh, and, and yeah. can I suggest this, this morning that when life is confusing, we need the strength yeah. that the corporate gathering provides. I think maybe more than ever. Than ever. But Jim, yeah. I want to ask you this because I, I know this isn't easy for pastors. You know, how do you apply, if you're a pastor, how do you apply this second behavior? Because when you're yeah. gathering with in the corporate setting, most of the time you're leading something, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. can you help me unpack uh, that? Yeah. I, I mean, I, I have two thoughts. One, one is I'm grateful for people that have lived longer than I've lived, have experiences that I'm now having and have resolved those experiences in faith. So the first thought is I, I went through a crisis. I was 31 years old. We had a three-year-old little girl that was in a car that was hit by a train. Hmm. Okay, three days, her brain swelled and she passed away. During those three days, as a 31-year-old first-time senior pastor, I did what I was taught to do and what I believed. We're going to pray for healing. We're going to trust God for a miracle. We're going to, and it's all in. You know, it, God wasn't sovereign when I was 31. God was the genie in the bottle, if that makes sense. I, yeah. I, and I have theology behind it. I mean, but the word theology is not a biblical world word. It's, it's a, it's the study of God, but in the study of God, it's not uncommon that we find the parts of God that we really want. And we study those parts. Does that make sense? Yes. So John, the, the Baptist being in prison and not having his prayers answered and dying by beheading because some hoochie, hoochie mama shook it for Herod. That doesn't fit well into a clean theology, right? Mm -hmm. That's a very messy theology, but it's also a biblical reality. So I, I didn't know what to do. If I was a carpenter, I'd have weeks or months or years to resolve my conflict of faith. But in three days, a very small casket's going to be in front of me and I have to tell people how good God is. Yeah. And, God, and the God that I know died with her. And I, I, may, I just want to say that I'm talking about crisis of faith. Yeah. The God that I believed in died when she died. So I still believe in God, but he's not, I don't know how to trust this God, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I went to the wisest person I knew. People all throughout the ages have done exactly what I did. I called my mom. <laughs> I said, no, I'm, I don't, I don't know what to do. I, I really don't know what to do. And I was crying. She said, Jimmy, stop crying. She says, I want to give you three words. That's going to give you a, a box to put this in. So you can, you can handle it. Here's a yoke that will help you contain the weight of this. And she said, these three words, I'll never forget it. She said, Jimmy, this isn't heaven. Mm. This isn't hell. This isn't heaven. This is that place in between. Yeah. We, we live in the middle of these forces and heaven saying, believe me, and hell saying, believe me. God saying, I love you, and the devil saying, no, he does. And we're, we're stuck moment by moment, decision by decision, crises by crises, trying to resolve life with faith. And yeah. that, that for me, I don't know why, but that really set my heart free. It didn't, I wasn't, like my confusion all went away. It wasn't. But it, it, my misunderstanding was when I tell God what to do, he has to do it or he's not God. That's not true. Yeah. And, and that's that, so, so yeah. Going to someone with faith who's been through life that right. has answers that in, that in three words, three words could save me three years yes. of struggle, three years of destroying my family, three years of destroying my ministry. In three words, my mom saved my ministry, saved my life, mm -hmm. saved my faith. So I, 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 I'm sorry, that was a long answer, but man, I go to those who, you know, you'd be amongst those who do believe that have been through hell and come out the other side. Yeah. yeah, that's important. And, I, and, I, and just to add on that real quick, I think it's I think what you're saying is people whose faith won't be shaken by your crisis. Yes. Yeah. You know, it I wasn't at all. Yeah. I want to yeah. go to people who I know I can share this with and they won't be rattled. Right. Um, yeah. By it. You know, Jim, uh, 
one of the things that I'd, I'd like to just wrap about real quick, and then we're, we'll yeah. we'll uh, we'll finish up with this pod is. Do you think, again, I'm asking you the question now, do you think that uh, understanding how God uses pain in our life will help us as we work our way through the crisis? Here's what I mean. This understanding, this this conviction, maybe it's a conviction that the pain that I'm going through, this, this crisis that I'm facing, somehow God is going to leverage that for something powerful down the road. Yeah. What do you think I, about I, that thought? Yeah. There's a, you know, uh, treating hard, hard times as discipline. God is treating you as sons. The scripture says, right. I, I would remind everybody that's listening. I assume they're listening because they're in leadership. Leadership means I, I know where we're going and I have a plan as to how to get us there by the grace of God. So uh, you and I, that one of the books that we wrote together, uh, putting the good and goodbye came out of a significant season of pain. Right. We had growth, growth, growth for, for two decades. And then suddenly there was this division and people were leaving down their churches and social media had been invented and they were bombing kind of in reverse. You know, the church I just left and the church I used to go to type comments and trying to lead people away, causing division. It was awful. And I thought, God, why am I going through this? I, I have, I'm not doing anything different now than when I was so blessed. And I, I really believe that the Holy Spirit enlightened me later on, not in that moment, but later on and said, you, you can only lead people through where you've been. And, mm-hmm. and so I, I think where, where God, God takes all things, uh, think of like dots. You see, remember they connect the dots? God yeah. takes every dot and, and it doesn't look like anything until they're all connected and then you see the picture. So I think we, we just have to trust that every dot, whether it's a good dot or a painful dot or a hard dot, a disappointing dot, a heartbreaking dot, a confusing dot, yeah. trust that the Lord is going to connect those dots. And as he does, as a leader, as a teacher, as a pastor, as an entrepreneur, you will take the lessons of painful seasons and you'll help people through their painful season with That's wisdom. Right. The God of all comfort comforts us in all of our afflictions so that we can comfort those who are going through the trials that we we've been through. So that's right. I theology is, is the knowledge, the study, the, the understanding of scripture, but the, there's a difference between knowledge and wisdom. Wise people are not the same as smart people. And I value both of them tremendously. I need them both in my life, but I'd rather have somebody who would successfully run a business for 50 years, give me business advice than somebody with an MBA from Harvard who got A's on all of his tests, but has never had a paper route. Yep. Like one person's going to have more knowledge than the other, but one person's going to have more wisdom than the other. I, I need stories that illustrate knowledge to be true. I need testimony because in my test, I need, I need someone who's been tested and, and has a testimony. So that would be, yeah. I'm with you. I, I think, I think 100% that God puts wise people in our lives. And what is a wise person? They're people who've made dumb mistakes and have learned from those mistakes and those lessons that took three years to learn in, in three minutes or sometimes three words. Can, yep. can help you through the crises of your life. That's right. You know, Jim, uh, I think if we're serious about deepening our faith yeah. as leaders and leading well for the long haul, we have to get more comfortable with ambiguity. Yeah. You know, when, when I was a baby Christian, everything made sense. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, seriously, I, yeah. You know, I had life figured out. Yeah. But I've walked with the Lord for more than four decades now, and I've discovered that faith requires me at times to make peace with ambiguity. Yeah. You know, things happen or don't happen that I can't explain. And, yeah. and, and yet I have enough history with God to know that he's good right. and that he can be trusted. So, so if you're listening or watching today, we really want to encourage you. You know, if you're in the middle of a season of doubt or confusion or pain, uh, please don't lose heart. Right. You know, be honest with God about how you feel when it when it looks like people who reject God are living the good life or reject you who are living the good life. Remind yourself that they're probably going through some things that you don't know about, that they have some pain in their life that you're not aware of. Um, Invite close, trusted, faith filled people into your struggle Mm -hmm. and, and let this become a mantra for you. God is good, mm-hmm. but I'm not exempt. Yeah. So that's really what I had on, on my mind today, Jim, with this pod. Yeah. I, I wonder if a thousand years from now, we won't consider our hardest times more of a compliment from a God who trusted us mm. and then a, um, a problem, a trial, a struggle. Uh, yeah. If, if God only gives us what we, what we can bear, 
and he'll never tempt us beyond, you know, what we can bear. The greater the crises, the, the greater the faith of someone who wants you to manifest mm. his reality to those who are watching. So yeah. I, I think this is something, John, again, I, I had a conversation with a wise person that helped me through my, my most significant crises of faith and as a young pastor. Um, I, I would look at you today. If I was a 31 year old pastor today and I was listening to this podcast and I was going through a crisis of faith, I, I probably would call you. And if somebody wanted to do that today, whether they're 31 or 71, how would they begin that conversation to take advantage of what you've seen? Yeah, Jim, it's, it's a really, really simple. Um, they can, uh, they can reach out to us best ways uh, through our website, convergecoach.com. And all over that website, there are these little buttons that say contact us or start a conversation. If you click one of those buttons, uh, there's a little form for you to fill out and that will get to us. And uh, we'll give you 30 minutes of our time just to see, you know, if we can be helpful to you or not. And if we can't be helpful to you, we know a lot of people who probably can be. So that's the best way to do that. Amen. So Jesus is not the light at the end of your tunnel. He is the light in your tunnel. And uh, we are praying for you, cheering for you, here for you, literally. I, like John just said, we're here for you. Let us know how we can help as you continue to lead from alignment.